Good day, Hill Church. It is a blessing to have reached the final session on hermeneutics and how to study the Bible with you all. Uh, let us pray. Father God in heaven, we pray to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for the gift that it is to know you, to be in Christ. It is only by your grace and mercy, God. Um, we are thankful. We thank you for bringing us into your church, your people. I thank you that we are the body and bride of Christ. And I thank you that Jesus nourishes us and cherishes us, gives us everything we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of him, and cherishes us as his own. For he loves us and gave himself for us, and now lives forever and intercedes for us, Lord. We're thankful for Christ. We're thankful for your word. Father, help us to be better readers of Scripture. Help us to pray as we read, to observe carefully as we read, joyfully, all the minute details of your word, uh, not as scholars, but as hungry students and children of you. Help us to interpret your word rightly. But Lord, we also need to apply your word. We need to be doers of your word. And we ask for help of the Holy Spirit to be as such. Help us to learn more of what that is and what that actually looks like in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, or look with me, to Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God's word says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. So reads the word of the living God. We've come to this last session in the study on hermeneutics, how to study the Bible. When we began, we defined hermeneutics, established the nature and the, and, the, and the authority of the Bible, and identified biblical hermeneutics, the literal, grammatical, historical method, emphasizing interpreting the Bible literally, according to the normal use of language, according to its context, according to its grammar. But in the second session, brought us to really the details and getting down to all of what that actually means, the interpretation process using the rules and methods of sound hermeneutics, the literal, grammatical, historical method. And these beginning steps dealt with the biblical genres and the initial step of observation in Bible reading, and then we covered the interpretation of Scripture in more detail. But now in this fourth and final session, we'll focus on the application of Scripture. And that's important. In the conclusion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached, if I might add, Jesus said this, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. In this closing illustration of Jesus, the wise or thoughtful, insightful, and listener with understanding is the one who not only hears Jesus' words, but does them. In other words, Jesus is calling his disciples to not merely hear the word, to not merely observe the word, or even interpret the word, but to be doers of his word, as his brother James later articulated in the letter of James. When it comes to approaching and interpreting the word of God, to put it simply, application matters. Application matters. Application is the use or practice of God's word in personal or corporate church life. 
I'll say that again. Application is the use or practice of God's word in our personal lives or in corporate church life. You see, there can be no true application unless we truly grasp and interpret the original meaning of the text. Furthermore, there's no contemporary or cultural meaning of Scripture because there's only one meaning, the author's intent. We must remember that in reading and interpreting the Bible, the primary focus is grasping the author's intent, the true meaning of the passage, rather than just reading to figure out our response. Nevertheless, though, Nevertheless, once we garner a faithful interpretation of the text, we must submit to God's word practically in our lives. God's life-shaping word must work out practically in our lives. To put it simply, the divine truth of Scripture demands a response. It demands a response. It's life-changing in the best, most joyful, and glorious way. The primary response to the Word of God should be worship of the God of the Word. Along with that, greater faith, greater faith that gives credence to Jesus, knowing Him to be true, but greater commitment to Him, greater faith in taking Jesus at His Word. And along with that, greater love for Jesus. Actually taking God at his word, trusting and fearing him, taking him seriously, those are preeminent applications always when we read scripture. There should be more beholding of Christ's glory and greater conformity to his image through the work of the spirit and the word. Nevertheless, there's specific responses with obedience to Scripture that comes as we read it. But all of application should be compelled by the love of Christ and informed by gospel truth. But when we come to Scripture, the question is not only what does it mean. We have to eventually get to why does it matter? How does this affect my life? What does this mean for my life? How does this change and transform my life. How does this apply? Tim Challies, a great pastor, author, and a blog writer, discusses three important aspects of application to the Word of God. He defines it as the head, the heart, and the hands. And that's really the head being the mind, um, the heart being our affections, and the hands being our actions in our life. So first, we'll look at application in terms of the head, which is allowing the word to shape our minds. An application in this sector can look like this. So I'll list out some questions. What does this passage, when rightly interpreted, but what does this passage teach me about God's nature? What does this passage teach me about who God is? How should I now think about God? So application isn't just going and doing something. Sometimes it's just changing how you think about God. Not just thinking about God as a God of wrath and a God who is just and a God who will come with vengeance upon those who don't know him through Christ. But recognizing that God is also a God of mercy and grace and patience. And understanding that those things aren't aren't opposed to each other. That's just the whole of who God is. Everything that he is, he is all the time. His attributes and perfections work in perfect harmony. So so it could be asking a question of what does this passage teach me about who God is? Or how does this passage bring me to a greater view of God? When angels in heaven are around the throne saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. How does this passage bring me to a greater view of God? And ask yourself, is there a truth here to believe about God? Is there wisdom to shape my Christian thinking? Is there truth here to believe about another doctrine? To believe about the person of Christ or the Holy Spirit or about what the church is? 
or who comprises the church to believe about growing in sanctification, to believe about the end times. Or you can simply ask, what does this text tell us to believe? Or is there an attitude I need to change? Is there a type of thinking I need to change? Do I only think in my head that logic and science is the chief authority? But this is telling me that the Bible is the sum of all truth. So is there an attitude I need to change? Or is there a warning to heed? These are questions you can ask in terms of application when it comes to the head, allowing the word to shape our minds. Let me just say this as well. As I list out all these questions, sure, it, 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 it could be nice and maybe necessary for you to have some of these listed as you're reading the Bible. But as you grow in everything that we're talking about in these four sessions, this will become a lot more natural to you. And it'll happen very organically. It won't be so mechanical, maybe. Uh, this will just be how you read the Bible. So if you're thinking, oh, this makes everything seem so mechanical, that w it'll become more natural. And it'll be joyful because you'll be getting deeper into Scripture. So I just want to say that to hopefully encourage you or to calm you down a bit. So that's application in terms of the head, allowing the word to shape our minds. Let's move on to application in terms of the heart, which is allowing the word to shape our affections. And one question with that is, what does this passage tell me to feel? So application in terms of our feelings. And that's so incredibly important because we can't just throw away our feelings. Yes, Scripture is the supreme authority. It is the standard and authority for everything. Scripture above all. It's the very word of God. But that doesn't mean that we just throw away our emotions. That doesn't mean that we just throw away our feelings and say that they're irrelevant just because they're secondary. Scripture's primary and emotions, feelings are secondary. They're not the source of truth or the authority by which we see the world. But God has given us our emotions. God has given us our feelings, and they matter. Scripture says to serve the Lord with gladness and to rejoice in the Lord always. And throughout the Psalms, we see so many emotions. So when we ask the question in terms of application and in terms of the heart, allowing the word to shape our affections, what does this passage tell me to feel is so important. Because we shouldn't throw away our feelings, but our feelings should be informed by Scripture. So we don't throw away or disregard our feelings. Our feelings just need to be informed by the truth. We need to have truth-informed emotions, truth-informed feelings. We need to bring our feelings, whether it's feelings of depression or sadness or feelings of joy or indifference or or lethargy, whatever it is, bring it to, to Scripture. Submit our feelings to Scripture and, and to allow the Word to inform our feelings. How does this passage tell me to feel? To rejoice always. Okay, how does that inform my feelings right now when I'm not feeling joy? What do I need to then think about? Who God is and how that's unchanging, the, the unchanging glory of the gospel? I mean, this is practical stuff, but we need to have truth-informed feelings. And that's the importance of the heart, allowing the Word to shape our affections. Another question you can ask in this realm is, what does this passage tell me to love? And obviously, all of Scripture is, is pushing us towards loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving Christ, whose love surpasses all understanding. Loving one another our brothers and sisters in Christ, loving the law. Scripture is filled with application of telling us who to love and also how to love, right? Because love is patient, love is kind, love does not boast. There's so much in terms of the affections and our loves in Scripture that demands a response from, from us. But also, what does this passage tell me to hate? So we should grow in love for God. We should grow in loving what God loves, 
but also in hating what God hates. And that flows into entertainment, what we watch or listen to. We shouldn't want to be entertained by something that God hates. So this is really practical things. So this is the heart, allowing the word to shape our affections. Is there a promise to trust is another question that can be asked in this realm. Is there a promise to trust? And that shapes our affections because God's promises are unchanging. They're fixed, just, be, just like God. He's immutable, unchanging, and in, 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 in a fixed being. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God's promises inform our feelings, inform our affections, and give us joy. So this is application questions that get us towards application in terms of the heart, allowing the word to shape our affections. So we've seen the head, the heart, now we come to the hands, allowing the word to shape our actions, to get into our life and what we do, how we live. So as we read scripture, we can ask, is this pushing me towards a sin that needs to be confessed? Is there something in this passage that's convicting me and showing me there's a sin that needs to be confessed? Or just as simple as, is there an explicit command that I need to follow? Is there a command in this passage that I need to follow? If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all righteousness. That's in conditional form telling us you need to confess your sin. Because God is faithful and just to forgive those of you who are in Christ. He's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. That's telling you to confess your sins. that's, That's an explicit command of Scripture. So asking, is there an explicit command that I need to follow? Or is there an example that I need to follow? There's so much in Scripture of just faithful examples of people. Paul's saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ looking at his life, looking at the life of Jesus, all these historical narratives. Is there, an, is there an example that I need to follow? Or you can ask, how can I advance God's kingdom based upon this passage? Getting into realms of evangelism, realms of the one another's of scripture. Consider one another as more highly than yourselves. Uh, look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Mourn with one another. Rejoice with those who rejoice. There's so many passages in that realm. Along with that, there's application in terms of the church. How does this truth intersect with the life of the local church? How does this passage, how does this truth inform me of how to be a better Christian in terms of my brothers and sisters in Christ in the local church, a better church member? a better servant within the local church? How does this intersect with life in the local church? Or just more personal application. What does this text teach about my relationship with God? How I walk with Him? How I worship Him? How I confess all those things in terms of walking with the Lord? There can be more missional application. How does this biblical truth prompt you, prompt us, to bring the gospel to the nations and to our neighbor? How are the great commandments expressed through carrying out the great commission? How does this passage inform me or or equip me to go forth in my life as an ambassador for Jesus, preaching the, the, the message of reconciliation, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them all that Jesus commanded, while also loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving my neighbor as I love myself. So just missional application, going forward in proclaiming the gospel, preaching the gospel, telling the world the good news of Jesus. And then there's what can be called salt and light application. You know, and Jesus says that his disciples are to be salt and light to the world, to be preservatives of righteousness, or to shine with his light in the world. You can ask, what does this text have to do with education, with me being in school or being in college, being a Christian in that context, with my social life, when I'm doing business, when I'm at my job? How does this inform my worldview? How does this inform my marriage, my family, 
or even my view of sex in this world. So there's salt and light application, being a Christian in the world and before the world. See, as Christians, we must remember the grammar of the gospel. I just want to emphasize this as we talk about application. So we talked about application in terms of the head, the heart, and the hands. And that gets into application in the church, uh, just personal holiness, a mission, and salt and light. But as Christians, we have to remember the grammar of the gospel. See, we don't follow Jesus after the pattern of if, then. If I do all of these things, application, then God will love me. Then God will do this. Then God will do that. No, that's not how we think about application. Rather, in step with the gospel, we follow Jesus in terms of because, therefore. Because of the person and work of Jesus. Because of the saving work of Jesus, because of the finished work of Jesus. Therefore, I live in a manner worthy of the calling to which I've been called. I live in a manner worthy of the gospel. I'll, I'll, I'll deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him. It's all a response to what he's already done. So I just want to emphasize the importance of remembering the gospel as we come to this realm of application. It's because of the finished redemptive work of Jesus Christ, that we pray in faith, that we deny ourselves, take up our crosses, that we read our Bibles, that we pray, that we love other Christians, that we evangelize and pursue holiness. And the list goes on and on of all the practicalities of what it looks like to follow Jesus. But everything we do is a response in faith to what God has already done. And this is application. And and it's the whole of life, the head, the heart, and the hands. But the truth of Scripture demands a response. We not only ask what does it mean, we have to ask why does it matter. So with all that being said, I want you guys to read, to interpret, and to draw application from Matthew 5, verses 3 through 11. So we're back to the Beatitudes of Jesus. The context for us is in verses 1 and 2. Jesus is beginning the Sermon on the Mount. Read Matthew 5, 3 through 11. And draw the application from it. What does this mean for our lives and and for what it looks like to follow Jesus? And that completes our our four sessions going through hermeneutics and how to study the Bible. I hope it's helpful. And uh, if you have any questions, we're around. Love to help you. And we're just praying that here at the Hill Church we'll be better readers of the Bible. That we'll dive deeper into God's Word. That we'll be people of the book that will not only preach the word, but read the word, sing the word, apply the word, and worship God informed by the word until our faith becomes sight. Let's pray, and that'll be it. Father God in heaven, we pray to you in Jesus' name. Help us to be doers of the word. Help us, Lord, to not only focus on and figure out what the text means, but let us get to why it matters and what it says for our life, and how it informs our life. Help us, Holy Spirit, illuminate our hearts and minds to understand the Word, and and, and help us to be doers of it, so that we live more like Jesus, as we follow, treasure, and cling to Him. In His name, amen.